Takže na tomto místě děkuji Janě Beránkové a dovolte mi, abych představil a na pódium pozval Petru Četerin, slovinskou architektku, profesorku na Fakultě architektury na Louplenské univerzitě, zabývá se finskou moderní architekturou společně s Radou Kutivou, který vystoupil dopoledne. Ano, potles pro Janu Beránkovou. Společně s Radou Rýhou, který vystoupil dopoledne, zkoumá, jak už předjela Jana Beránková aplikovatelnost Babiů a myšlení do architektury a její teorie. So, um, hello everybody. Uh, I would like to thank first um, uh, Jana Berankova for inviting me to take, place, uh, take part in this conference. Uh? Michael Hauser. Michael Hauser also. I haven't met him yet, but thank you, Michael, uh, very much for inviting me. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so I would, I would also like to thank uh, Jana for uh, bringing us into the world of architecture. So uh, we are already within it, and I can continue here. Um, I will uh, the probably. Um, I think I I agree on this m main point of Jana's talk, but let's talk about that later. I think I will. It's it's best if I first present my own position. Uh, so first of all, um, I am taking part in this seminar as an architect. Uh, with which I want to say that I'm interested mainly in the, question, in the questions and problems that uh, are related to the theory and practice of architecture. One such problem that has to urgently be confronted today is the closing of the very possibility of the existence of architecture. Architecture as a creative or thinking practice. This is, for instance, what the Office for Metropolitan Architecture, OMA, keeps reminding us, uh, it points continuously in different projects, mainly research theoretical projects, to the fact that in today's world, ruled by the order of yes, yes to yen, the euro, the dollar, architecture is no longer possible. It keeps pointing to the impossibility of architecture. I'm interested, however, in a step forward from this fascination with the end. And I think that with the help of philosophy of Alain Badiou, a break through this end point can be made, a break towards a new beginning. Uh, and this is the position or the conviction I will try to develop in today's talk. So let me begin with the situation today. This situation can be presented in a systematic way by defining the fundamental positions in which architecture appears and works today. I will define these positions according to two criteria. The first criterion concerns the task of architecture. Either it is assumed that architecture has a task of its own, that it is determined by itself from within, or that it serves some outside goal or interest, that it is determined from outside itself. I will call architecture, which is determined from within by itself, architecture as architecture or architecture as a creative practice. The second criterion concerns the understanding of its role. Architecture is seen as either holding a critical position to society or as accepting the way things are. By combining both criteria, we can determine four fundamental positions in architecture today. I call them architecture of market logic, architecture of the imperative of invention, architecture of impotent resistance, and architecture of reformist sociality. So let's start with the first position. Briefly, I will present each one of them. Architecture of Market logic. According to this position, the world which is run according to the market logic is 
a given and unproblematic fact. Architects should accept this fact, because otherwise they will not only lose their jobs, but they will lose architecture itself. The market determines whether an activity is required or not, and so if architecture doesn't compete successfully on the market, it will become redundant and will be replaced by some other form of industry. For this position, architecture is simply an industry, and products of architects are simply products that are meant to compete for the success on the market. So this position understands architecture as a service activity. It isn't interested in architecture as architecture. The insistence of architects on the so-called architecturalness is for the advocates of this position something that can actually endanger architecture. This practice is not about architecturalness. Architecture has to fulfill the demands and desires of people. Of course, in the way that these demands and desires are dictated by the market. As to the second criterion, for this position, there's no question whether architecture can work as a critical practice or not. Architecture makes sense only if it serves this world and if it serves it well. There are thousands of buildings that are built all the time that are good examples of this orientation. These are generic office buildings found in every city or then equally generic houses or housing found in every suburbs. They are dressed just uh, like in opposition to the previous example in this kind of quasi-traditional outfits. Okay, let's look at the second position. Architecture of the imperative of invention. In tune with this position, invention is the driving force of architecture. Architects have to be daring and imaginative. imaginative. They have to perform the jump into the unknown again and again. According to this position, architecture has a task of its own. It is defined by itself. This task is the invention of the new within the field of architecture. And in the view of the advocates of this position, this can be done without intervening in the broader field of society. In fact, for them, there's nothing particularly wrong with the contemporary world. This world favors creativity, invention, production of the new. So it's actually in favor of the project of architecture. But this position has uh, one of the problems it has is its in understanding of the new. Because for, this, for the advocates of this position, the new is simply the most fascinating from everything that is fascinating, the most interesting from everything that is interesting, the different from everything that has already been designed and built. The new is not that which intervenes in the very criterion of the existing. Just the opposite. The existing is taken as the criterion of the new. So behind the appeal to an invention of the new is thus actually hidden the appeal to a reproduction of more fascinating, attractive, entertaining objects. This position actually accepts the logic of the market as architecture's own logic and thus works as a supporting part of the capitalist system. An example of this practice is the ongoing competition for the design of the tallest building in the world, for instance, or the continuous search for the most spectacular built form, uh, which is known today as, you know, as spectacular architecture, who is going to be more wild. Next position. According to this position, architecture has a task of its own. Its task is to design structures that are not only useful and usable, but are also architectural, examples of architecture. And according to this position, architecture has another task. It has to critically intervene in the existing culture and society. According to this position, architecture should be critical, should indeed must change things for the better. This is indeed of the primary importance. Actually, for this position, only an engagement for changing society for the better justifies architecture, gives meaning to it. This position starts from the following logic of reasoning. If critical position is possible, 
then architecture is possible. But this position keeps facing the fact that in today's world there's less and less possibility for such a practice. First of all, the very possibility of practicing architecture in this world of yes is put into question. Architecture is being trivialized, is being reduced to nice things that also Jana talked about, glittering facades, fleeting images, spectacular forums, curiosities. Or it has been simply reduced to the images of architects. Today, today it doesn't really matter anymore what is made, but who made it. The media, of course, plays a highly significant role in this process of trivializing architecture. And not only that, there's also less and less possibility for architecture to critically intervene in the social reality. Not only do governments no longer invest in public housing or in any kind of public building projects that would be open to all, but actually, that actually used to be built in the, be in the first half of the 20th century, but actually the very possibility of being critical is put into question today. The advocates of this position are well aware that the system of globalized capitalism works in a way that it is able to turn every critical position to its own benefit into the reinforcing of its own system. Every critical position represents only a new poten potential market niche. Of course, sustainable architecture is the best example of this, as you know. This position keeps realizing that there are only very rare examples, rare instances when meaningful architecture can actually be made. One such example which has been awarded again and again is the Women's Center in Senegal designed by female Finnish architects Holman Reuter and Sandman. This is what this position stands for. This building fulfills both key tasks. It has distinctive architectural qualities and it significantly improved the status of women in the local society and the everyday well-being. But such practice is possible only exceptionally. This is what the advocates of the architecture of which I call architecture of input and resistance argue. There are exceptional cases of the good practice of architecture. There are exceptional sites where such practice is still possible. But in the developed world, here and now, architecture has found itself in a dead end street. We can move to the fourth position. For this position, today's world is highly problematic. This is a world of enormous social disparity and injustice. A world of seas of poverty on the one side and tiny islands of extreme wealth on the other. In such a world, it is absurd to think that anything significant could be done with architectural means. With what the advocates of this position mockingly refer to as architecture with a capital A or architecture conceived as art. Instead of focusing on itself, on its own problems, architectural problems, architecture should face real problems, such as the fact that one-sixth of the world's population lives in circumstances that fulfill the classic definition of slums. According to this position, I show this image which doesn't show any structures except architects being ready to take action. According to this position, the task of an architect is to facilitate good economical and efficient technical solutions. The second task of architects is that with their knowledge and practice, they support economical and political programs. Even if these programs don't change the economical logic of the existing, argue the advocates of this position, they contribute to some degree at least to the project of social improvement. So let's look now these four positions together to determine the kind of possibilities for architecture as architecture they offer. The first and fourth positions share the view that architecture is in service. In the case of the first position, in the service of the market. And in the case of the fourth position, in the service of the project of social reform. 
they both give up on the practice of architecture as architecture. Thus only the second and third positions remain relevant for our specific concern. Both of these insist that architecture has its own task, but they both have a problem as you saw. The second position openly promotes the practice of architecture as architecture, but actually it supports accepting the logic of the market as architecture's own logic and thus puts architecture in the service of the capitalist system. Only the third position really insists that architecture has its own task, which it considers inseparably connected with the critical approach to society and culture. The problem of this position, however, is that it considers the practice which it advocates as an ideal, as something that used to be in the past, or as something that is somewhere else, like in Africa or South America, and not as an actual possibility in the here and now. So each of these four positions points in its own way to the inability of architecture to position itself and work in the given world as a creative thinking practice. This analysis, which I just showed you, actually points to a radical crisis in architecture. It kind of reconfirms the diagnosis of Oma and others. It points to, to an impossibility of architecture. And it is at this point that the next step should be made. In my view, this step is possible insofar as we follow but use Maxim to hold on to a real point. This means to hold on precisely to that which for this situation is its impossibility, and that is the possibility of architecture as a creative practice. To hold on to a real point, in our case, means to posit a hypothesis. There is an architectural capacity. The capacity of the working of architecture as architecture. The effect of this capacity is that it gives products of architecture a stamp of architecturalness. And to this, I add the following thesis. Also, architecture as architecture itself is organized around a real point. So we have to hold on to two things. Firstly, that architecture as architecture, or architecture as a creative practice, is possible. And secondly, that architecture as architecture is itself organized around the point of the impossible real. And I will call such a practice the fifth position. Let me return just for a moment back to the four positions. All four positions define themselves in two ways. Either they see architecture as being determined from the inside or from the outside and they either see it as a critical practice or as a practice of accepting the given. According to the fifth position, however, architecture is at itself outside itself. Being outside itself means being critical to the given reality. That architecture is at itself outside itself means that precisely when it works in its own intrinsic way, when it is determined by itself, does it interrupt the logic that dominates today's capitalist system? The fifth position is actually not that different from the third position, in the sense that they both insist on architecture as architecture and on its critical ability. But the third position is looking for permission for such a practice of architecture in the given circumstances, in the situation. As I said, it follows the following logic. If a critical position is possible, then architecture is possible. The fifth position, however, posits the insistence on the possibility of architecture as architecture as its starting point. It actually enforces this possibility, which is also a condition for its critical ability. It follows the opposite logic of reason reasoning. If architecture is possible, then critical position is possible. So now, in this second part of my talk, I will try to present this fifth position. 
as a starting point, I will take the view of the architect Kenneth Frampton, who argues that in order to preserve architecture and not to accept that it is turning into but a giant commodity, we have to insist on that which is intrinsic to architecture. And that is the way in which it produces its objects. A specific architectural way of producing objects is, according to Frampton, construction. More precisely, tectonic construction. Tectonic construction is a term that emphasizes the materiality of the process and the materiality of the products of this process. And well in tune with this position, Frampton argues that construction, I quote, is ontological rather than representational in character, and that built form is a presence rather than something standing for an absence, end of quote, and concludes that we may think of a built form as a thing rather than a sign. What I find particularly important in this thesis is Frampton's emphasis that architecture is something material, that it is a thing and not a sign, that it is something that counts in its bodily presence and not as a representation, a substitute of something absent or hidden. That the product of architecture is a thing, I understand in the following way, and here I leave behind Frampton's line of reasoning. A product of architecture is a thing because it is a bearer of a special kind of materiality, of architectural materiality or materiality of the real. And because of this materiality, the products of architectural construction are objects of a special kind. They can be best described by Badiou's description from Second Manifesto of Philosophy as things that possess a value, a sort of particular resistance that can be appropriated by another world, another culture or individuals than the world, culture or individuals that participated in their emerges, emergence and development. They function in a transworldly fashion. Created in one world, they're valid actually for other worlds and virtually for all. Here I end the quote. So let me now explain what I mean when I say that the product of architectural construction is a special kind of materiality. I will do this by using the example of a joint, an architectural joint. In architectural theory, a joint is seen as the fundamental nexus around which architecture is articulated. We could also say that a joint is some kind of elementary particle or an atom of architecture. Frampton, too, defines a joint in this sense, if I refer to him once again. He argues that a generic joint isn't simply a connection, but it is a point of ontological condensation. What does this mean, in my view? It means that in a joint, in a joint, excuse me, architecture itself is or is not present. More precisely, it means that in a joint, if only for a moment, the very being of architecture kind of shines through. I connect the being of architecture here to the materiality. I find the elements of being in a moment of the special materiality of architecture. Thus it can be said that in a joint, the architectural materiality of an object is present, which, to repeat once again, is not an ordinary materiality. A joint creates architecture as a thing. This is the same structure designed by JKM M Architects from Finland, a church and Paris center. And let's, let's look now at the example of a structural joint in which I will, in a concrete example, try to present what I mean with the production of architectural materiality what I mean with saying that a joint creates architecture as a thing. So as you see, I'm coming closer to the structure and even closer to just four joints. So what you, you please look at one of these units and you see four. What we see here 
in one unit. We see six wooden elements, four vertical, no, four, yeah, four vertical and two horizontal. And at the same time, we don't see only these six elements. We see something else. We see their connection. How does this connection work? So we only have six elements. The joint, the specific, well-considered scheme according to which these elements are connected isn't some additional seventh element. The joint isn't something that objectively exists. And yet it has effects. It works. It works in such a way that we see we actually see the connection of the six elements as a successful architectural solution, as the occurrence, the embodiment, or incarnation of architecture. The joint causes us to see the six elements in front of us as a body of architecture. This is a special kind of body, because objectively speaking, there's nothing else there but a combination of interconnected elements, sh only six wooden elements. So this structural detail can thus be described in the following way. It is something else than the elements connected into the joint without actually being something else. It is an object of a special kind, an object that is two at the same time, two in one. It is a structural detail composed of six elements, and at the same time, precisely as this structural detail, it is also something else, a body of architecture. And if this connection is poorly articulated, if it doesn't succeed, if elements are badly connected, we see only the elements and the failed attempt to connect them. In this case, there is no architecture present, only a structural detail. And the same that holds true for a structural detail, a fragment of the building, holds true also for the building itself. A building itself is also, I mean, this, we're looking at the same building all the time, and this building, the whole thing, is also constructed out of different elements and materials. And here, too, is decisive how they are connected. If the connection is successful, we get a building that is an ordinary useful object in which we live, perform different functions, whatever we do, which is ordinary object. It's constructed from various elements and materials. But at, at, at the same time, we see this ordinary useful object as a successful architectural solution. We see it as the very thing, the very body of architecture. Here we have, so to speak, two objects in one. A useful object and a thing of architecture or an architectural object. The bu this building, for instance, can thus be described in the following way. It is an ordinary useful object, which is useful object in the way that it is at the same time, also something else. It is also an architectural object. It is something irreducibly architectural, without actually being something else. The same can be said for the other architectural object. This building, which you see here, for instance, just an example, is an architectural object, which is an architectural object in the way that it is, at the same time, also something else. It is also just ordinary useful object, without actually being something else. What does this mean, that each of these objects is something else without actually being something else? This simply means that this something else can't be subtracted from each of the two objects, that it can't be separated from them. These two objects can't be separated. It is not possible to subtract this something else from a useful object and get a pure usefulness. Nor it is possible to subtract this something else from an architectural object and get pure architecture. For this something else, without actually being something else, I use the term minimal difference. A building that is a successful product of architectural construction 
is a useful object that is built upon a difference which separates it from itself. This difference is intrinsic, constituti constitutive for this product. And this is why it is an object of a special kind. It is an object with an inner difference, a split object. It is one which is two at the same time. For this object, can it did indeed be said that it has a double materiality? The ordinary materiality of wood and concrete, bricks, steel, and at the same time also the materiality of architecture itself. Both materialities are inseparably connected. But the materiality, which is the effect of the joint, the effect of a good construction, is objectively speaking invisible. Yet it is more durable and enduring than the materiality of wood, concrete, bricks, or steel. It is that as a result of which successful products of architectural construction possess that particular resistance to time and place, to quote but you again, quote, they work in a transworldly fashion, they're created in one world and they're valid for other worlds and virtually for all, end of quote. So if we argue that the creative practice of architecture is organized around the real point, then this real point is a construction that produces this special architectural materiality. The production of this materiality is what architecture is all about. The materiality of the real. The real as that which is created in one world but works in a trans-worldly fashion. It endures in different worlds, different times and situations as that which always remains the same, as some persistent and resistant sameness. And it, as it has to be emphasized, and, and of course I'm referring to Badiou here, it persists because it is created, which I understand in a sense that it persists in the way that it can always be recreated. I try to show that in the case of architecture, the creation of architectural materiality, the, the thing of architecture is construction, tectonic construction, and that this things lives on as long as it is recreated, as long as we see it in successful products of architecture, and as long as we succeed in making it visible, in reconstructing them, or reconstructing it in our own practice, in some other form, and in the medium of design or writing or building. So to conclude, I think that by now it is already clear that the fifth position works in the way that precisely when it affirms itself as architecture, when it affirms the specific materiality of architecture, it pierces the world, intervenes or infringes on it from the inside, so to speak. This position, the fifth position, is indeed radically different from all four positions, which constitute four ways of excluding or concealing architectural materiality, the thing of architecture. All four do so in various ways, which I described at the beginning. Does they actually represent four ways of reducing architecture to the serving of the existing? Insistence on the fifth position, on architecture as architecture, however, is an insistence on architecture's transformative capacity. We could also say on its critical ability. Insisting on architecture as creative practice is indeed the way in which architects can take part in the opening of the seemingly enclosed world of globalized capitalism. But this insistence has two parts. One part is practice. One part is making of various kinds of joints. The other part requires that we have to know how to explain and justify the notion that in the construction of architectural materiality there is no divine miracle at work and that it is not the result of some mysterious talent or uh, genius either, but that it is the result of a rational way of working, which is indeed a truly human way of working. So I think I would conclude with this sentence, architecture needs, in addition to its design practice, 
also its philosophy, a philosophy of architecture. 